Raw is still the number one box office concert movie in history, so I don't know what records nobody broke, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I broke Eddie's record. <laughs> I ain't been on stage in 27 years. They still trying to break my record. God bless y'all. <laughs> you gotta admit, Kevin Hart's on top of the comedy game right now. But man, he's been catching heat lately, and not the good kind. Seems like everyone's taking shots at him, especially his fellow black comedians. You know how savage comedy can be, right? These guys can lift you up one minute and tear you down the next with just their words. So it's no wonder Kevin might be feeling a bit uneasy. But why would a successful dude like Kevin be sweating bullets over some other comedians? Well, here's where Eddie Murphy steps in. The man, the myth, the legend himself is apparently gearing up to spill some tea. Rumor has it there's some real dirt hiding in Kevin's closet. We got a sneak peek when Cat Williams decided to spill some earlier this year. Kevin tried to clap back, but you could tell he was rattled. Now, with Eddie and the crew supposedly getting ready to drop even more bombs, it looks like Kevin might be in for a bumpy ride. Seems like he's not in the clear just yet. So, let's dig in. Now, Eddie Murphy is like that cool uncle at the family reunion. Always laid back. Never causing any drama. So, if he's stepping up to call out Kevin Hart, you know it's serious business. These guys have respect for each other. They've even teamed up on projects like Meet Dave. But even with that history, Eddie's not holding back on calling out Kevin's BS. So, what's the supposed shade about? Well, there have been whispers about how Kevin climbed his way to the top by cozying up to big shots in the industry, maybe even stepping on some toes along the way. And then there are these rumors about some seriously shady stuff he might have been involved in. Eddie's been in the game since the 90s, man. He knows the ins and outs of this industry better than most, so he would definitely be in the loop about Kevin's supposed skeletons. Also, take what Cat Williams said, for example, on the Club Shay Shay podcast. Cat straight up called Kevin an industry plant, pointing out how quickly Kevin rose to fame, scoring a sitcom and starring in Soul Plane all within his first year in L.A. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold-out Kevin Hart show, there being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy club. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. What do you think a plant is? According to Kat, this raises eyebrows and makes Kevin's early history seem a bit shady. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to LA and in his first year had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. He continued saying, what do you think a plant is? Maybe people don't understand the definition of these words. All right, for those who need a catch up on the ongoing beef between Cat Williams and Kevin Hart, let's dial it back a bit. It all started with the movie Fool's Gold back in 2008. Williams was supposed to take the lead, but his legal issues at the time made him pass on the gig, which was filming Down Under in Australia. Then, in walks Kevin Hart, swooping in and grabbing the role. And that's where the tension between Williams and Hart started brewing. This feud's been going on for over a decade now, and it's still up in the air when it's gonna end. But another thing took place back in 2008. Cat dropped his new special, It's Pimpin' Pimpin', and he was riding high. But around the same time, Kevin's making moves too, stepping into roles that Cat might have thought were his. See, according to a lot of folks, Hollywood has this thing where they push one black comedian into the spotlight at a time. Fast forward a bit, and Kevin's blowing up, landing roles left and right, while Cat's Hollywood journey hits a few bumps. There's this back and forth. Kevin's rising, Cat's dipping, and neither of them are backing down. In 2016, things get physical when Cat allegedly gets into it with some fans who prefer Kevin's comedy. It gets messy, with Cat throwing shade at Kevin, and Kevin responding with some Instagram humble brags. The guy that sits on top right now have taken advantage of all the money that I have. I've shot over 56 specials for the up-and-coming generation of comedy. Why? Because I'm trying to create opportunities for others. So rather than complaining yeah. about it, mm -hmm. I'm fixing it. Mm. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. I also take full responsibility for any and everything that I've done in the fucking business. Mm -hmm. Good or bad. 
My frustration with Cat Williams comes from you keep pointing at Hollywood. Hollywood this, the white man, this, this, and this. When do you take responsibility for your actions? You had the shot. Cat was in that position at one you point. You were the guy. Yeah. You were set up to be the star. You didn't show up to work. You fucked off promo shoots. You fucked off your promo f- uh, trips that they had set up for you. You became a risk to the studios, which is why the studios stopped f- with you. Why was he a risk? He chose drugs. Oh, okay. Take responsibility for what you chose and say, you know what? I got to fix me and I'm going to come back and I'm going to stand up for comedy. Then Cat throws down the gauntlet challenging Kevin to a comedy showdown for five million bucks. It's like, are they gonna rap battle, box, play basketball? Cat's ready to settle it once and for all. But even with all this drama, both Cat and Kevin keep hustling. Cat's winning awards, dropping Netflix specials, and popping up on TV shows, while Kevin's stacking up movie roles and Netflix specials of his own. The thing is, this rivalry might never truly end. They're just too different. Cat's all about that edgy, truth-telling comedy, while Kevin's more family-friendly. It's like two different worlds colliding. Cat didn't beat around the bush when he aired out his complaints. He straight up voiced his worries about letting folks who might not be straight up spin their own stories without any checks. He talked about how unfair it is that liars out there get all the perks and resources, leaving the rest of us playing catch-up. And he's not sold on the idea that having all those resources means you're telling the truth. According to Cat, it's a real concern, letting these shady characters run wild with their own stories, especially when they're sitting on a pile of resources. But Cat isn't naive to the fact that speaking out might land him in hot water. He knows folks might see him as just another bitter, jealous comedian behind his back. When asked if he feared any backlash, Williams kept it real, saying, These people are not powerful. Satan can't create anything. That includes blessings for his people. That's why, you know what the number one job of somebody that sold their soul in Hollywood is? What? Is to act like it didn't happen. They all do the same job. Why do you think Gary Owen can't cross over and he already white and been in comedy for 25 years? If what I say ain't the case. Now the whole idea that Kevin Hart is an industry plant isn't exactly breaking news in Hollywood. There's been talk for a minute that entertainers are kind of pushed into wearing a dress on screen, almost like a ritual before they can level up in the fame game. And it's not just Cat Williams talking about this. Even Dave Chappelle has touched on it. Back in 2006, during an appearance on Oprah, Dave spilled some major tea about why he turned down a whopping $50 million deal from Comedy Central. Dave wasn't chasing the cash because, as he explained, big bucks often come with some serious strings attached. Being in the showbiz game since he was 14, he'd seen and heard stories about what goes down behind the scenes. He pointed out examples like Mariah Carey landing a $100 million deal, only to end up mysteriously labeled as crazy a few months later, or Martin Lawrence making it big and then suddenly waving a gun on the streets, screaming about someone trying to take him out. It's those stories that had Dave on edge. When Oprah asked him about hearing these tales, Dave laid it out. He'd seen it happen before, and it always went down when a person's career was on the brink of reaching the next level. According to Dave, it felt like they were asking him to put himself on blast for a paycheck. There's more to this whole thing. Dave Chappelle dropped a bomb about being asked to wear a dress for a movie he did with Martin Lawrence. He walks into the trailer, sees the dress and thinks, nope, not happening. Turns out, it's for a scene where Martin's character sneaks out of jail by dressing Dave up. But Dave's like, nah, That wasn't part of the deal. They try to push him, saying it's hilarious, but he stands his ground, saying he doesn't need a dress to be funny. It gets intense, with everyone pushing, but Dave sticks to his guns. In the end, they come up with a new scene without the dress, and Dave's left wondering how they came up with it so fast. For Dave, it wasn't just about wearing a dress. It was about feeling like the industry was trying to corner black artists into doing whatever it took for success. This whole experience opened his eyes. It took being told to wear a dress for him to see the bigger picture and realize he wasn't alone. Lots of other black men had been asked to do the same. Martin Lawrence rocked it in Big Mama's house, Eddie Murphy nailed it in the Nutty Professor series, and Jamie Foxx made his mark with his unforgettable ugly Wanda on in living color. Then you've got the Wayans brothers trying their hand at it with white chicks. Oh, 
and let's not forget the less successful Juana Man. In the mix of all this, Tyler Perry takes the cake with his media empire. Meanwhile, an up-and-coming Kevin Hart joins the conversation, dropping wisdom left and right. Kevin's all about artists protecting their brand, setting boundaries, and not crossing certain lines. At that point, he was sticking to his beliefs, no dress drama in sight. When the topic of wearing a dress for a role came up, Kevin was straight up like, nah, not happening. He knew his boundaries and was all about protecting his brand. He even mentioned turning down a request to dribble a basketball on a talk show because it would make him look foolish. It's all about protecting the brand, plain and simple. Just a year later, bam, Kevin's on an SNL skit sporting a dress. His fans, especially those loyal to his nine-year-old Oscar nominee character, weren't having it. Accusations of selling out and being fake started flying around. It was like, wait a minute, weren't you just preaching about boundaries and protecting your brand, Kevin? The plot twist got fans feeling some kind of way, and they called him out for doing exactly what he said artists shouldn't do. But then Kevin Hart pulls a total 180 on us, flipping the script from his earlier stance on wearing dresses. At first he was like, no way, not putting on a dress. Fast forward to when the opportunity knocked, and he found the whole idea funny. Suddenly he's like, why not? I'm doing it. Of what I felt was funny, I thought, oh, that's funny, I'm gonna do it. Oh, Kawanzane is, is relevant. Yeah, that's funny. She's small. I can do the whole thing. It'll be funny. Uh, I think now, knowing about the opportunities, that that can be thrown at you. It's all about choice. You know, nobody makes you do anything. Nobody says, this is what you got to do. This is the only way that you're going to do it. Nobody made Martin put on the dress in Big Mama's house. Nobody made Tyler Perry put on the dress as Medea. Nobody made Jamie Foxx put on the dress as Wanda. And nobody made Martin do it as, as Shanene. You know? But here's where it gets sticky. Kevin goes into defense mode, saying nobody forced Martin Lawrence into Big Mama's house, or Tyler Perry into Medea, or Jamie Foxx into Wanda's dress. It was all about choice, according to Kevin. He's hitting us with the it's all about choice narrative. But then there's this counter argument floating around. People are saying it's not just about choice. Kevin himself wasn't okay with the idea before the money talks began. When the cash starts rolling in, suddenly integrity takes a back seat. It's like money becomes this magical thing that makes people do stuff they swore they'd never do. And truth be told, when that paycheck comes into the picture, folks tend to reveal their true colors. Remember when Steve Harvey dropped that bomb about integrity? He straight up said, give me 10 million and I'll embarrass myself all the way to the bank. He was willing to throw his integrity out the window for a hefty paycheck. It's a harsh reality, but he put it out there. So after Kevin did the whole dress thing, his career skyrocketed. He became the highest paid comedian ever, raking in cash like nobody else. It's like the dress move was his golden ticket to success in the comedy game. People might argue about the sacrifice of integrity, but at the end of the day, Kevin's laughing all the way to the bank. And then there's Monique, dropping bombs about how Kevin supposedly ditched her when she was going through some real rough times, facing heat from big names like Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry. And if that isn't enough to raise your eyebrows, there's talk that Kevin's been cozying up to both Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey to climb the Hollywood ladder. Back in 2021, there was this memorable episode on Kevin Hart's Comedy Goldmines podcast where he had the legendary Monique as his guest. They went deep into Monique's life, her rise in the comedy scene, and where she stands today in her career. Now, if you're not familiar with it, Monique has had some long-standing issues with Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry. And trust me, we'll get into that later, so hang tight. I want you to hear me, Kevin Hart. Let's move past that, Mo. Let's do some great things together. Don't even worry about it. Whatever y'all want to do, I will partner with you. I'll executive produce with you. You just let me know what you want to do. Now, let me say that before we go any further, because okay. I want to make sure I give Kevin Hart his proper credit. We get a call from Endemol. Endemol says, we just got a call from Kevin Hart's manager, Dave Becky. And Dave Becky said, Kevin doesn't want anything to do with Monique. So whatever she told y'all, he doesn't want to do anything with her, nothing. You know, he doesn't want any, any kind of relationship with Monique. During their conversation, Monique opened up about the struggles her family faced, describing it as being up against the wall. That's when Kevin Hart, being the stand-up guy he is, stepped in to offer his support. He expressed to Monique that she's like family to him, a mother, an aunt, a sister all rolled into one. 
And Hart didn't just stop at comforting words, he took action. Now, Hart admitted he didn't really know Oprah Winfrey personally, but he promised Monique that he'd reach out to Tyler Perry, and he did just that. After a heartfelt conversation with Perry, Hart came back to Monique with some promising news. Perry was ready to bury the hatchet and move past the drama. Hart, being the voice of reason, urged Monique to do the same. He told her, let's leave all that negativity in the rearview mirror, Mo. We've got bigger things to accomplish together. But Hart's generosity didn't stop there. In a conversation with Shannon Sharp, Monique revealed that Hart not only offered emotional support, but also extended a professional hand. He proposed to partner with her and even offered to executive produce any project she wanted to bring to life. So here's the scoop. Monique spilled the beans about how Kevin came through big time, lending her a hefty sum of cash, and get this, she even returned it with interest. But here's where it gets juicy. After Hart promised to help her get her talk show back on track, naturally, Monique was over the moon. I mean, having Kevin Hart as a producer could skyrocket any project. So she excitedly tells her producers and her media production company, and they're all on board, thrilled at the prospect of working with such a big star. But plot twist. Two weeks later, Monique gets hit with some devastating news. Her team drops the bombshell that Kevin Hart's manager, Dave Becky, gave them a ring to say that Kevin had cold feet. Monique picks up the phone, hoping for an explanation from Hart himself, and what does she get? A vague reassurance. We'll talk Tuesday, don't worry about it, he says. Monique hasn't heard a peep from Kevin since, but hold up, here come the armchair detectives. Some fans are crying foul, suggesting that maybe Kevin never intended to help Monique in the first place. They're pointing to his sketchy track record, like that time he claimed he didn't really know Oprah Winfrey. I mean, come on. Who could forget the whole Oprah sending him flowers after his accident in 2019? Uh, I got a lot of flowers. Um, you know, I was embracing everybody's flowers until Oprah sent me flowers. And then I realized nobody else loves me like Oprah. Um, <laughs> Oprah, Oprah's flowers are still alive. I've never seen anything like it. These flowers, I mean, I've never seen flowers like this in my life. She sent, she sent the, I mean, it's a full-fledged, it's a jungle. She sent the jungle <laughs> to my house in, in like, in a box. And I mean, we honestly been waiting for it to die. Like, there's an mm -hmm. ongoing joke mm -hmm. in our house. We're like, did Oprah flowers die yet? And everybody's like, no, nope, not today. And we're like, wow. <laughs> In a chat with Ellen, they got into it, with Ellen explaining how she reached out to Kevin after hearing about his accident and back surgery. Kevin shared that he received plenty of flowers from well-wishers, but it was Oprah's floral gift that stood out. According to Kevin, Oprah's flowers are like a never-ending story, still thriving and turning his place into a botanical paradise. It's become a joke in his house, with everyone wondering when Oprah's flowers will finally call it quits. And now he's claiming he doesn't really know her? Seems fishy, right? And then there's the wild rumor mill spinning tales about Kevin selling his soul to the likes of Oprah and Tyler Perry. Supposedly, if he had lifted a finger to help Monique revive her career, it would have put his own career in jeopardy. Now let's circle back to her previous beef with Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry. This drama started way back in 2009 when Monique starred in Precious, a movie produced by Oprah and Tyler and directed by Lee Daniels. The dispute began when Oprah and Tyler insisted that Monique promote the film without compensation. Monique immediately objected, stating that it wasn't in her contract. She disclosed that she received a meager $1.50K for the entire movie, which she considered insufficient. She found it unacceptable that they expected her to travel globally to promote the film for free. Oprah and Tyler reacted poorly to her refusal resorting to damaging her reputation within the industry by portraying her as difficult to work with. Now, to Tyler Perry's credit, Tyler Perry called us up, right? And he said, I can see the pain in you and I can hear it, and I want to let you know that I, I, I would never do nothing to hurt you, but the conversation kept going on. Only for Tyler Perry to admit he did start a rumor that I was difficult to work with. He lied. Only for Tyler Perry to admit I was wrong and when my movie Boo come out, I'm going to say that, right? Monique recounted how Tyler Perry suggested that she consider promoting the film, promising lucrative future movie deals worth millions if she received an Oscar nomination or win. Monique responded by questioning the feasibility of such salaries for a black woman 
and asserting that she couldn't work without compensation. She communicated her stance to Tyler, expressing her belief that working without pay was unacceptable. Their exchange reflected a fundamental clash of values, and Monique remained steadfast in her position. Their exchange kept going, with Tyler insisting he doesn't believe in handing out money for free. Monique fired back, saying she refuses to work without pay, emphasizing they're on the same page. It's a classic clash of values, and Monique wasn't budging. Monique accused Tyler Perry of interfering with her acting opportunities. According to her, it began after she declined an invitation to attend the Cannes Film Festival to promote Precious. Initially, the movie studio requested her presence in France, but Monique, juggling various commitments as a talk show host, comedian, and mother, politely refused. Despite attempts to entice her with a hotel room upgrade, she and her husband remained firm, prioritizing family time. They thought they had reached a mutual understanding, only for Monique to later discover she was being labeled as difficult. When the studio persisted with a third call, inquiring about her availability for Cannes, her husband straightforwardly asked about compensation. It was then revealed that they had no intention of paying for promotional appearances. Monique disclosed that she received a paltry $50,000 for Precious, emphasizing her decision to participate was based on friendship rather than financial gain. Responding to suggestions that she needed the money, she remarked on societal norms dictating one cannot work for free. Despite the studio's lack of objections initially, subsequent reports portrayed Monique in a negative light. The situation boiled down to a simple disagreement over compensation, yet Monique found herself unfairly criticized, sparking further drama. So, here's where it all went south for Kevin. Rumors started flying around that he was cheating on his ex-wife, Tore Hart, with his current wife, Eniku Hart. Kevin and Tore split in 2011 after eight years of marriage, and Tore was the one who dropped the divorce bomb, catching Kevin red-handed with multiple women. And get this, there's even talk that Eniku might have been one of those side pieces while Kevin was still married to Tore. Tore opened up about feeling betrayed, not just because she's not big on divorce, but also because she had to see Kevin everywhere. From billboards to Hollywood events after everything went down, she thought they were gonna be a power couple, you know, paving the way for strong black women, but it all came crashing down. But here's the real gut punch. Tori wasn't just his wife, she was also behind the scenes, writing jokes for Kevin's movies and stand-up gigs. But did Kevin ever give her props for her comedy genius? Nope. And to make matters worse, he supposedly spent the cash he made from those jokes on his flings. Can you imagine standing by someone, helping them rise to the top, only to have them joke about cheating on you during their stand-up routine? Yeah, that's rough. But now, things might be heating up even more for Kevin, because Torre is hitting the road on tour with Cat Williams. And you know the deal with Kevin and Cat? They're like oil and water. So people are scratching their heads, wondering what's going on there. Torre spilled the tea on Instagram, posting a pic with her good buddy Cat Williams and announcing that she's joining his Dark Matter tour. The post even included a snippet from that viral Club Shea interview where Cat went all in, taking shots at Kevin and a bunch of others. And when Kevin was asked about Torre joining Cat on tour, he tried to play it cool, but you could practically feel the annoyance oozing off him. Even though Kevin's brushed off the rumors about him, saying they're no biggie, they've probably still left a stain on his rep. With Eddie Murphy stepping into the spotlight to address the disturbing behavior surrounding Kevin Hart, the comedy world is abuzz with speculation and anticipation. As rumors swirl and tensions rise, it's clear that this saga is far from over. Eddie's voice adds a new layer to the unfolding drama, leaving fans and critics alike on the edge of their seats, eager to see how it all plays out. As the dust settles and the truth comes to light, one thing's for certain, the comedy scene will never be the same again. Stay tuned for more twists and turns in this gripping tale of fame, loyalty, and the price of success.